Hey guys, we are back. We're uh, jumping back into the book of Acts chapter 2. Uh, turn in your Bibles if you'd like, or digitally, uh, open up to Acts 2, uh, verse 14, because we're going we're to jump in there. But before I do, I want to remind us of a little bit of what we talked about last week, because it's got great context for today. So um, the, the time of Pentecost had just happened, and there's flames of fire on their heads. Um, there's, there's 15 uh, languages that are being spoken. Um, by these uh, people. Uh, it, it's basically the gift of tongues that are happening, uh, but they are languages of 15 different nations. And at that time, when there's uh, a group of them up in an upper room that this is happening, uh, there's a, this sound that draws a bunch of people. And as it draws these people in, uh, this is an opportunity uh, to uh, present um, what's going on. And Peter and they were they were asking these this group of people were asking what is this right and so peter stands up and uh, and that's where we're going to we're going to dive in so in verse 14 of chapter 2 uh, it starts here and it says peter stood up with the 11 raised his voice and proclaimed to them fellow jews and all you residents of jerusalem let this be known to you and pay attention to my words for these people are not drunk, as you suppose. Now, they had mentioned at the very end, uh, you know, what's going on here? Ah, oh, they're just drunk, man. Well, it also said that these were devout men that had come. And so that's interesting because uh, devout men meant that they were the, the highest point of piousness in their religion. And that group of people would know that they wouldn't even drink until after the first hour of prayer, which was nine o'clock. So they knew that these guys weren't drunk. It says, uh, Peter continuing on, it says, since it is only the ninth hour in the morning. On the contrary, he says, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now, I want to stop there for a minute because Peter led by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Pentecost has happened. He's filled by the Holy Spirit, but he's being led by the Holy Spirit. That's important because Peter, being led by the Holy Spirit, is going to point them back to Scripture as proof for what signs and wonders are and the legitimacy of what's going on. Okay, there's a strange thing happening here. And, and the very thing that the Holy Spirit does is point back to Scripture through Peter and says, hey, this is that which was wrote about already in the scripture. And I would say uh, that there's a lot of strange things going on today. Uh, a lot of um, crazy things out there that uh, are being done in the name of Jesus. And if you can't point back to it, um, back, back to the scripture as proof for it, that it's from God, I would say beware. Uh, it, it's probably not God. Now, Let's take a look at a couple examples of what I'm talking about here, okay? There's a televangelist that, um, and not all televangelists are, are you know, wrong, but there, there's this one uh, that I watched that uh, literally he waves his coat over a group of people and they fall down and they just kind of like, they're in this like trance almost, just not aware of anything. They're just kind of like uh, bewildered or whatever. Um, or they, these people bring up a few people and, and he pushes them over and they fall over and, and, and but some, he has two guys that will lay them, kind of bring them down nice and gently. And, uh, and, and supposedly that's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And you know, what's funny is even my daughter, when I was, uh, doing some research on this and showing her uh, what was going on. She goes, hey, dad, if that's the Holy Spirit doing that, then why aren't the two guys on the side being knocked over? <laughs> it's funny how even a 12 year old could pick up on some of these things. Right. But um, yet I find it funny that, you know, you can't find that stuff. in. I don't find it funny that you can't find it in scripture, but I do find it funny that these guys are making millions of dollars doing this stuff. And yet you don't find it in scripture. Or how about uh, there was a, a, a so-called revival, all right? And uh, there were reports of in this revival 
where uh, people were being slain in the spirit, all right? Slain in the spirit. Uh, the last time I saw uh, in scripture two people being slain by the spirit, it was Ananias uh, uh, and Sapphira. They uh, were lying to the Holy Spirit and he slayed them all right and killed them, all right? Uh, but in this case, uh, they say that the manifestation that came from them being slain in the spirit was uh, uncontrollable laughter. That they couldn't control themselves. It was just laughter and they just could not stop. It was uncontrollable. And, uh, and yet, if we just look at scripture for a minute, all right, in Galatians 5.23, it says, the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Self-control. That literally, by having the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in you, you have self-control, not uncontrolled, so then my, one of my favorites, this is just mind boggling. Uh, there were reports of people that um, when they were slain in the spirit, they were literally roaring like lions and uh, making other animal noises. I was always taught uh, by my dad that uh, if it uh, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? Uh, but these people were just, uh, yeah. I don't know what to say about that one, but their leaders claimed that this was a manifestation of the spirit. But you simply just don't find this stuff in scripture. And if you see these sorts of things, my suggestion to you is uh, run, uh, honestly. Uh, beware of these type of people and these types of things. Now, I, I've had people ask, um, is this fully staged then or is it legitimate uh, is some of it legit yeah i think some of it's legit uh but i do think some of it's staged as as well but here's the thing uh even if it was all legitimate we need a context through scripture as to what is that? what is it i mean how is it happening right let's take a look at Exodus 7, uh, chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. And we're gonna find that Satan does a really good job of mimicking what God does, all right? The works that God can do, Satan often will try and mimic. So, in this section, starting in verse 8, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh tells you, perform a miracle, tell Aaron, take your staff, throw it down before Pharaoh. It will become a serpent. By the way, that is a, a pretty big miraculous sign and wonder, right? That's a miracle right there. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Pay attention. But then Pharaoh called the wise men and sorcerers and the magicians from Egypt, and they also did the same thing with their occult practices. Each one threw down his staff and it became a serpent. So we know right off the bat that you know Aaron does what God says, a miracle happens, the this, this staff it becomes a serpent, there's a number of guys from Pharaoh's group. They throw down their staffs and Satan does the same thing, mocks what God did. Only God has the last laugh because in the next sentence it says, but Aaron's staff swallowed their staffs. They became staffless. So I think it's um, notable that just because a manifestation is happening, um, some sort of sign and wonder, uh, some sort of miracle, it doesn't mean it's always from God. It doesn't mean that. So we got to be careful. Now, what are the purposes for these gifts then? And what are they? Right? I mean, we ought to know and, and, and be aware of what God in his scripture has given us as instructions for understanding um, what they look like and what they're for. You know, it's been said, uh, I remember in, in school ministry, they said, you know, the best way to tell uh, a fake, right, um, in, in 
the FBI training, they take a, a real hundred dollar bill and they study that hundred dollar bill for a very long time. So that when they run across the fake, they have studied the real one for so long and so intently that they immediately spot a fake. So in the word of God, we find what the gifts are. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 11. It says, and Paul starts with, uh, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were unbelievers in God, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute uh, idols. Now, if this was written today to us, it would be some pastor saying, hey man, re remember when you weren't following Jesus and you were going after uh, astrology, you were going after uh, this or that. There's all sorts of things out there that we could chase, right? Well, that's what he would be saying. And, and Paul, by the way, has to correct the Corinthians on this matter of spiritual gifts. Uh, he literally is writing a letter at one point to them saying, hey, you guys are off basis on what you're doing, your practice of what you're doing. And so he's going to give some clarity here. He says in verse four, starting there, now there are differing, there are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. What he's trying to communicate in that moment is there is one God, there is one Holy Spirit, there is one person that is at work in these gifts. Therefore, if uh, someone's acting in one gift and it's there's a, another gift that's interrupting and disturbing uh, in that moment. It's probably not God because he's not going to do something that would uh, confuse us. And he's not going to do something where he's uh, contradicting himself or fighting himself for attention. It just wouldn't be. So that's why he says, but the same spirit, right? But the same Lord the same God at work in all of us, right? And so now he's going to give some clarity as to what these manifestations are. In verse 7 he says, as, um, as a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for, here's our one of our reasons, for the common good. So that's that's one of the reasons we are given the gifts. And, and we're going to elaborate on that in just a moment. It says, to each one is given a gift, right? To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Notice a trend there. He's, he's drawing our attention. It's the same Spirit that would be doing this. So it's not going to be one person doing one thing and then the whole room is like different gifts going on. It's not. It, it's We're all... Um, gifted by one person that's doing it and wouldn't it be interesting that you know if you think about it the gift of wisdom um, or, or a message of wisdom that gift in particular is to literally give someone wisdom so maybe God gives me uh, a message of wisdom for somebody and that would point them back to, hey, God's paying attention and caring for my needs, right? And he's, he's letting me know what the wise choice to do in this, uh, whether to marry her or marry not, right? Um, then it says, the gift of healing by one spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. Uh, to another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To know whether something's evil or, or good. Uh, to another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of that tongue. One and the same Spirit is active in all of these distributing to each person as he wills. So, that's Paul's drawing our attention right there. There's these gifts, but one giver, right? And he's, he's not trying to... Uh, distract people he's trying to draw people to christ he's trying to build up the body and here we're going to find out uh, another list 
um, there's some more gifts. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. So, there's a reason for these gifts specifically outlined. And it, it goes back to um, the common good. It says, to equip the saints, so it's for equipping, for the work of ministry. So literally, we're to uh, be ev evangelizing, drawing people in. We're to be um, uh, leading people as pastors and shepherds. We're to be teaching people. We're to be equipping the saints, uh, believers in Christ, for work of ministry. And then it says to build up the body or to build up, literally. That's what these gifts are for, building up the body. Until we all reached unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing into maturity. Now there's the goal, growing into maturity. Now what does maturity look like? With the stature measured by Christ's fullness. So it's the fullness of God living in us that literally is what maturity looks like. So. We are given these gifts to build each other up for the work of the ministry, to have unity and faith and knowledge of, of who God's son is. And so that we could be um, able to look like Christ. Now he goes on and he says, uh, then we will no longer be children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching by human cunning with cleverness and techniques of deceit. He's warning you, don't be caught up in these things that you see. But, it says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. That's looking like Christ. Let us grow in every way into him who is the head Christ. So we're to actually look like Christ when we're mature. And, and what is it um, accomplished by? Speaking truth in love. You know, it's been said that um, truth without love is like surgery without anesthesia. Nobody wants that. Now, we know that the goal is to look like Christ and to be mature, right? That's the goal of these gifts. Now, Peter, moving on, he said, remember, this is that which was spoken. And he's trying to let them know these manifestations are the things that were spoken of by Joel. And then he goes on to talk uh, with them and give them the, the prophecy of Joel. And it says, in verse 17 in Acts 2 and it will be in the last days God says that I will pour out my spirit on all people then your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams I will even pour out my spirit on my servant in those days servants in, in those days men and women and they will prophesy now that's what he's talking about that's happening current in his time in that moment in the last days he's saying so in the last days means that we now are in that period he's starting to talk about the manifestations that he's just labeled out but in the next section we're going to know that these things haven't quite taken place yet because it's about the return of christ and it says here in verse 19 i will display wonders in the heaven and above Sorry, I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the return of the Lord. So that hasn't happened yet. So Peter's talking about events that are happening and future events. And why is that important? Well, because he doesn't say in here that any of those gifts are going to stop until 
the day the Lord comes. There are uh, teachings out there that the gifts were only for the, the original 12 apostles. But here, if we go back to scripture, like the Holy Spirit drew them back to scripture, we see that actually the, that time hasn't come. So therefore, we're still in that time of manifestations of the Spirit. Now, Peter is saying to the listeners that the end times have become, uh, begun. It's been over 2,000 years, but don't, remember, don't forget that, and remember that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says that as the time goes to the Lord, a thousand days is a, a or a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. Therefore, it's only been two days for him, right? And there's about 2,500 prophecies that are in the Bible, and almost every one of them have been fulfilled up until this moment uh, with 100% accuracy. And so there isn't much time left before the return of Jesus. And this is what Peter's drawing their attention to is that they need Jesus. And that's why the very next verse is verse 21. Then everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. He's making us aware, making them aware of the main thing that literally it's not signs and wonders we chase, but man, we want to realize that time is um, ending soon. And that we we want to be aware that man there are people still to be saved and so what are we to do as we gather knowing that the time of jesus return is near we're to occupy our time with building one another up through the gifts of the spirit with the goal of maturity and that will look and act like christ like jesus so, what are you following? Are you following signs and wonders for themselves? Or are you following Jesus through the Holy Spirit, which may lead to signs and wonders, but will always lead to love and looking like Jesus? Hey, the, our time's up, but join us back next week as we jump back into um, verse 22, and, and we're gonna see how Peter brings us back to the main thing about Jesus. So until then, love you guys.